Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. In the last lecture, we talked about different types of correction that need to be done in PET imaging before you reconstruct a patient. And in this lecture, we're looking at even more types of correction that need to be done. A prominent one, for example, is patient motion. For example, when you're in a PET scanner and you're getting a scan taken, you're breathing, most likely. And so the radiation inside you is moving as your chest contracts and expands. Now we have ways to correct for this. For example, we can tell a patient to hold their breath for 30 seconds, take a scan for 30 seconds, pause and do that over and over. And this helps make sure that everything is consistent when you're taking the image. We'll also talk about the limiting factor to the resolution of PET, which is the positron range. When the radioactive material emits a positron, it moves a finite distance before it annihilates with an electron and two photons are emitted. We have no way of knowing exactly where that positron was emitted from. And so there's always gonna be a margin of error of where that positron came from. In a sense, this blurs our PET image and reduces the resolution. And it's the ultimate limiting factor to the resolution of PET imaging. So in this um, short lecture, we're gonna move on to um, the last four parts of these eight phenomena that degrade uh, image quality in PET. So let's talk about variations in detector parasensitivity. Um, PET scanners have several thousand detectors, tens, let's say 10,000, 20,000 um, detectors. And so um, we should have corrections that can lead to non-uniformity issues. And since a photon can enter a detector from different angles, especially in PET because you're not having a collimator, you're not just coming at 90 degrees, you're coming from many different angles. The cross section, uh, for example, changes. So there's angle dependent sensitive, sensitivity of, depend, uh, of detectors. So you really got to correct for these. You can't just do reconstruction without having taken those into account. Uh, for example, how the sensitivities of your individual crystals are varying from day to day or month to month, week to week, month to month, uh, and also these angle dependent sensitivities. So there's a whole literature behind that. We're not going to go through that, but this is called normalization. Um, so often this is performed using a uniform rotating rod source that just rotates around, for example. Um, and is sort of at the periphery of the field of view. This circle, this white circle being the field of view is at the periphery. And it's basically because pretty much all lines of response go through uh, this rotating rod. Um, and you do this measurement um, because ideally, you know, everything should be uniform, but it's not. This, the crystals are varying. Plus again, when you enter a crystal at different angles, the sensitivity changes. So by just doing that, you know, for example, it used to be a very long acquisition that people used to, used to do. So they were looking at all possible lines of response. How many counts am I measuring in this um, line of response when I do this? Because it's supposed to be a constant, but it's not a constant. So I'm going to then take my measured, you know, I calculate the normalization for all these detector pairs. And then when I measure and do an actual PET scan, then I can, for example, correct for that PET scan, kind of like attenuation correction where each line of response you can correct for. But you know, more increasingly, people also incorporate that normalization into the image reconstruction. You don't have to pre-correct the data. You could put it in the iterative image reconstruction. Um, and also it used to be a very long scan, but people figured out that, you know what? Um, there is more sophisticated so-called component-based normalization approaches where by doing more, more mathematics and geometric modeling, we're not gonna need as many counts uh, to be able to do these calculations. So it's called component-based normalization where you're, you're not gonna need so many counts to be able to achieve this. But, it, but the essence remains the same. You have a rotating rod source, it is covering all lines of response and based on those measurements, um, you're estimating the effective sensitivity um, and normalization factors for all lines of response. So that's normalization. And so here's an example. Um, look at this column first. If you do not do attenuation correction, you get the usual dip that we, we keep seeing and we keep talking about. But if you do perform attenuation correction, but not scatter correction, then you start to see this hump, which again, we've seen before. 
because now you've taken care of attenuation correction. Even if this X was not here, you would get a very similar profile. You get this significant drop in counts into the center of the object. But once you correct for it, now you get an over, you get a hump. But once you correct for a scatter, uh, but not normalization, you may get a non-uniform image because you're not taking care of the non-uniformities for the different lines of response with respect to each other. And once you do correct for all of those, you do end up getting more and more uh, uniform image, uh, images, okay? So decay of radioactivity, that is the most straightforward correction nuclear medicine. So I'm just gonna very quickly go over it. Basically, if you know your radionuclide, you know how it decays, you know the half-life. So all you have to do is, you know, let's say you're doing multiple acquisitions over time. Well, you can easily correct one acquired frame with respect to another acquired frame, for example. Uh, so that's called inter-frame decay correction. But also there's this intra-frame uh, correction. What does that mean? If I start imaging right now and acquire for five minutes, um, fluorinating 110 minute half-life. Within those five minutes, there's still some decay happening. It's not too much for fluorinating. It would be far more if you were using like C11 or rubidium 82, but still there's some decay happening within those five, five minutes. Well, there, you can easily go through the integral and do the formula and you can see that there's this easy correction factor uh, that you can do to correct intra-frame decay too. Meaning you're, you're sort of saying, if no decay was occurring, how many counts would I get? So you just bump it up. You multiply the final reconstructed image by a very simple number to do intra-frame correction. And then between different frames of time that you're acquiring, you can do correction. So this is, this is actually very easy to do. So let's move on to the more complicated one, and that is resolution degradation. Um, so in PET, resolution can be degraded due to the following events, the, um, some of which are unique to PET. One is positron range. We've talked about this before. Positrons need to sort of slow down um, to lower energies before they can combine with an electron to annihilate. So that positron range, like we saw a number for fluorinating was like around 0.22 millimeters. For other uh, radionuclides, it, it's, it can be higher. For rubidium, it can go all, all the way up to two millimeters. But for fluorine 18, it's small, for some, it's larger. But essentially, that's kind of like a, that limits resolution, right? Um, because the event starts here. This is what you really want to image, but the positron travels somewhat, again, sub millimeter scale for fluorine 18, and then it annihilates. So that's one cause of potential cause of resolution degradation. Another one, which is a funny one, if you've never heard of this, is photon non-collinearity. Technically, this positron is having a momentum. So when this positron and an electron, they annihilate, well, conservation of momentum tells you that technically these two gamma rays can't be exactly at 180 degrees because you're not conserving momentum, for example, in this direction. So they can be slightly bent, and this is an exaggeration. So that number is on average 0.25 degrees. It's a very, very small, 0.25 degrees only deviation on average from, um, from, uh, from uh, 180 degree. But that 0.25, it turns out that if you have a large diameter scanner can add up to you know, a couple of millimeters. So this is a formula for it. And I want you guys to prove it for 0.25 degree deviation that the full width at half maximum of, of the, the blaring essentially that you get in the image is given by this number with these, the detector pair separation. And finally, you could have um, crystal or detector blaring phenomena. And there's really two of them. Uh, one is where you may enter and simply penetrate. You, you enter this detector, but you penetrate without any interaction and then you're detected here. Actually here, so I should be showing you this. So you kind of, you're going in here. It does not get detected. It travels a bit more because you're coming at an angle and then it's detected here. It's called penetration. So the reconstruction thinks it, it was, it entered this detector, but it really entered this detector. So you can imagine that there's a bit of a effect there. So especially as you move away from the center of the field of view and you're entering crystals at an angle, penetration is an important issue. And that's why as you get away from the center of the field of view, the resolution can degrade as a parallax effect. Scattering is just like you enter, at, it could be even at 90 degrees, but um, 
as we've talked before, it may scatter from one crystal, go and enter another crystal, and then so the location may be misplaced. Um, so just to go over those again, so you've got the positron that is being emitted, it can travel, um, and then it annihilates, and then you've got the non-collinearity effect. So the line of response is thought to be here, but the event was actually here, and it actually was even here. So these two are adding to resolution degradation. And then finally, you could be entering, maybe penetrating over, or even not penetrating, but just scattering. So, so being misidentified. Uh, the crystal in which you enter is being misidentified. So what, how do we deal with this? For the longest time, these things were not dealt with. You were thinking, okay, I'm doing randoms, I'm doing uh, scattering, I'm doing all the things. This is just a fact of life. But then people started thinking, well, why don't we also model for these phenomena in our statistical iterative reconstruction? So if you do it within your reconstruction, we call that resolution modeling or PSF modeling or resolution recovery, especially in the spec world. In spec world, you don't have positron range problem. You have like, let's say, collimator detector blaring and you know, things, like, uh, things like that. But when you model these phenomena, detector blaring and other things, in the reconstruction, we call that resolution recovery or resolution modeling, PSF modeling. But if you don't model it in the reconstruction and you do it after reconstruction, somehow you deal with it in the reconstruction, that tends to be called partial volume correction. But these methods have become very popular in uh, new scanners. Uh, so here's an example of a camera that sort of models that you have a robotic uh, arm that moves point sources all over the field of view. It measures how things spread and how things distribute. If you've got 90 degrees, this is the profile I get. I only have scattering. If I go at an angle, this is the profile I get. I have both scattering and penetration. So that's why it's asymmetric. It's penetrating to, to this way as opposed to that way. So you model these and you can model this within your um, image reconstruction. So this field of PSF modeling has been a major frontier. And again, that allows you to, instead of having this parallax effect, for example, and this blared kind of point sources, parallax is when, again, the resolution degrades as you move away from the center of the field of view because you're having this penetration effect, especially as you get away from the center of the field of view, because you're enter more likely to enter at an angle when you're away from the center of the field of view. So you get this parallax effect. Um, but when you do PSF modeling or resolution modeling, you get better images. And here are examples of images or better looking images, okay? It, they're not necessarily better. They look better. They look sharper. They have better contrast. They have better resolution. But the noise texture changes. And sometimes you may get edge artifacts or edge overshoots. Like this is non-PSF modeling. This is PSF modeling. You sort of might see these dips. If you have really sharp edges, you may start seeing like, like a sort of a Gibbs ringing artifact. You sort of see it in these images. This is without PSF modeling. This is with PSF modeling. The images look sharper. They look like they have better contrast, but sometimes at the edges, you can get like ringing, Gibbs ringing. Um, but people have tended to switch to it. Sometimes I, I know, for example, um, you know, in the clinic, I remember that uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins University, we would not use this for brain imaging because of these phenomena. Um, so you have to look at it carefully when uh, you use it when you don't use it. But most people and have switched to using PSF, but it's good to be aware of edge artifact effects. And the fact that noise texture might be a somewhat different, you have to get used to it. But there are studies showing that detection performance can improve, for example. So we've shown this image um, multiple times before. Um, okay, so we've shown this um, uh, figure before, this is actually for SPECT imaging, but it's the same thing. If you don't do any correction, you get this. If you do attenuation uh, correction, but not scatter correction, you see this hump. Because now you've dealt with this um, underestimation because of attenuation, which is a dominant effect. But now you're dealing with this overestimation that was hidden underneath here. That's scattering. But once you correct for that, uh, you get this uniform distribution. Um, and then when you do resolution modeling or resolution recovery, as it's being called here, the images look different. The noise texture changes. You, you get these edge effect. Again, that happens if you have sharp edges. So it's something to be aware of, something to be careful about. But again, resolution modeling, resolution recovery, 
is an option. PSF modeling is another name, is an option that's available on new PET scanners. Uh, and um, it's something that many people are trying. So here's a, an article where, which I wrote years ago, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I put PET against SPECT just because I was actually trying to learn. This was my, in my early years, in my early career years. I had, you know, uh, I was thinking about, you know, what is PET? What is SPECT? How do they compare technically? So you may want to look at this article, and it sort of goes through differences by comparing them. I learned more about this. Uh, so this is one reason why this article is um, being read by uh, different people. Um, and so, so you can go through this yourself and sort of see, okay, in PET, we don't need collimators. So that gives us better sensitivity, no depth dependent collimator blaring, but it does give us random coincidences. It does give us increased scatter fraction. Uh, it can give us uh, uh, somewhat higher attenuation, but again, the sensitivity is higher. And then you have these other resolution degrading phenomena in PET, but then PSF modeling can try to correct for them. So go through this article if you have the time, it sort of reinforces some of the concepts we've been talking about. Here's another question for you to, to try on your own. Since no collimators are used in PET, what are the three factors that limit intrinsic resolution in PET imaging? And finally, to wrap this talk, a few quick slides on patient motion. So these first six are routinely used, applied on pretty much every study. This seventh one is increasingly used. This eighth one, there's been significant efforts in this direction. Sometimes it's done, sometimes it's not done. And there's a lot of developments in the past couple of decades, but sometimes people do it, sometimes they don't do it. And I think there's a lot of room for, continues to be a lot of room for, for, for innovation. So as spatial resolution improves in PET imaging, this means that patient movements become more significant sources of resolution degradation. If you're getting a better and better and higher resolution PET imaging, but motion is there, you're not using the high resolution of your scanner. So, so as you know, engineers are improving this, and as physicists and image reconstruction people are improving this number as a combination of hardware, improved hard hardware, improved software for image reconstruction, but if we're not dealing with motion, we're not using the full potentials of a PET scanner. There are different kinds of motion that we have to think about. If you're especially focusing on the heart, then the motion of the heart is important. Cardiac cycle is obviously very important. Uh, in general, respiratory motion tends to be very important or very present. And there's other movements, uh, movements that are not regular like these or predicted like these, but you know, let's say you're, you're coughing, you're drifting, you're crossing your legs and, and things like that. Um, so here's an example of gating. Uh, and what happens in the concept of gating, you could do this for cardiac imaging. And this is routinely done for cardiac imaging applications. PET where you use the ECG signal from the heart to determine the different gates. And so you do gating. Respiratory gating is less popular. There's a lot of activity in this area. Um, and the idea is think of this as a, a cardiac cycle or a respiratory cycle. Uh, here, let's think of it as respiratory cycle. So you could, if you have the waveforms, if you're measuring the waveforms of your respiratory you know, patterns, well, you could subdivide this into multiple gates. This is just one, let's say this is five seconds. Well, within these five seconds, you could divide this into, let's say, eight parts, and then you throw all the data to these eight different um, projection data or sinograms. And then you enter the next five seconds, and then you, again, you throw the data to the appropriate gate. And you do this for minutes, right, as you're acquiring data for the subject. So you get all the uh, different gates added to the appropriate, all our different data added to the appropriate gate. And so let's say in this example, you end up with eight uh, frames. And then you reconstruct those frames, you get eight different kinds of images that represent the breathing cycles. So, so instead of acquiring a single blurred image, we're acquiring several images and each of those will have less blaring, but they will be more noisy, right? Because you're subdividing your data into an eighth of the signal or a fifth of the signal or a sixth of the signal. Uh, there are other ways where you, where you, you actually uh, do this more effectively. It's beyond the scope of this discussion, the quiescent phase and things like that. As number of selected gates increase, the duration and motion per image also decreases. 
So you can do more and more gates, and that gives you less and less motion. That's good, but it also gives you less and less signal per gate, per frame, so noisier images. So here's an example of a non-gated, non-respiratory gated PET scan or PET image. Uh, there is actually a tumor here, but we almost missed it. Uh, but then after you do respiratory gating, this is one of those, you get this. And the, you know, the standard optic value increases significantly in this really you know, ex example. But please do notice the image is getting noisier. So even though you're kind of moving from here to here, you're seeing this, but you're seeing other things here. Uh, so there is an opportunity for false discovery, right? So you may call this also a tumor, right? So that's one reason, guys, that this is not popular right now in the clinic. The capability is there. Many sites have respiratory gating, gating capabilities. But because when you do gating, um, uh, cardiac gating is extremely popular. It's very, very valuable. Respiratory gating is also valuable, but it, in practice, because it adds noise to the individual gates, many sites are not using it, unfortunately. And what people are trying to do next is to say, wait a minute, okay, we get these eight really noisy images or five noisy images or three noisy images or two noisy images. Can we combine them instead of just viewing them separately? Can we do like a non-rigid registration to then get a high quality, less blurred, but not noisy version of it? So, so people are moving that direction and also something that helps this technology move forward is if you move from hardware-driven approaches, perhaps to software-driven approaches. It turns out that the signal, the raw signal you're measuring, the detection, detected uh, counts. If you, for example, put a center of mass in your measured data, you actually see the center of mass moving like this. I remember years ago when I saw this, I was shocked. I was like, wow. Just by looking at the data, I see the center of mass moving and I'm capturing the signal. So for that, you don't even need to be wearing something. You don't need to be tracking how you breathe. You could look at the data. So there's a lot of activity towards data-driven uh, motion correction. Some people call this software-driven. Uh, and I think the other point is, yeah, you do get noisier images, but if you take the next step and you combine these multiple gated images into a single non-noisy image that is actually sharper, you could, you could, that could be the solution. People have been doing this either by uh, registering the post-reconstructed uh, gate, gated images to a single frame, like a non-rigid registration, or you could do this in the reconstruction, you know, so-called four-dimensional reconstruction, where you take all those eight gated data sets, you do a single reconstruction combining all of them having estimated somehow motion between them and reconstructing a single really nice image. So there's a lot of activity in there. It's not routinely used, but, but um, it's pretty safe to say that this is the way of the future and, 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 and these kind of softwares uh, are going to be, are already showing up and will be showing up more and more. So concluding remarks, compensating for above mentioned phenomena, the eight phenomena that we mentioned in these two lectures can make pet images more and more representative of true underlying distribution enabling improved image quality. And this also enables quantitation with PET imaging. Beyond just getting nice and prettier images, we can actually do quantitation with PET imaging. And this allows us to do things like measurements of standard optic value and to do so-called kinetic modeling. And these are things that hopefully we will discuss in the future.